Hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I just want to point out that I saw Mike Brennan eat his dessert today. I just not that I'm tattling, but the last speech inspired me to uh, be vigilant. <laughs> the other uh, kind of shallow comment I want to make is that I'm going to use the chair. It's a shameless promotion. Um, <laughs> but if you have a moment, you can, you can come up and sit in these. Given what you're sitting in, you're really going to like this chair. <laughs> um, John is a dear friend. His father, Jack, is here today. And uh, the journey at Steelcase is fun to talk about as it relates to transformation. There are a few pictures of furniture, but frankly, I, I do have a personal love and affection for the Mayo Clinic. Um, Dr. Brennan's and LaRusso have been uh, quite active in you know, asking me questions for a decade about transformation. Uh, I'm a patient here, uh, at least every other year if they don't find anything wrong. And, uh, and I send lots of people here from the company to get well. So uh, like many of you that are speaking today, you get a chance to come to things like this, but this is personal. So I have a great affection for the moment. And in that vein, I thought, you know, I should just talk to you in a way to have you peer kind of inside my head about the question of trying to transform something that's been so successful. And I spent a great deal of my career as CEO for 17 years not thinking so much about furniture, but thinking about the question of work. Kind of mastering that question has been a lifelong ambition. And I don't think I'll ever graduate, but I can give you a, a point in time kind of clue today. For me, it, it led me to try and understand the nature of complexity. This is actually the September issue of Harvard Business Review. Why are they speaking to CEOs and business leaders about complex systems theory? It's because transformation is so difficult. It's so difficult for some reasons I'll show you later in the slides. But to ground us all, in the simplest form, complexity is about a number of independent variables that in their own way are kind of decision makers. They interact, and then they fight for emergence, or persistence, as I call it. Or as the scientists call it, uh, label it fitness, in a different term than we heard from that last great talk. Fitness of a system is its ability to survive. And thinking about Steelcase, but this applies to the Mayo Clinic and other long-lived institutions, there are a lot of variables that are interacting. And in a way, this was a stress relief for me to stand back because I, when I inherited the, the leadership mantle, we had 28,000 employees at Steelcase. Today, we have 12,000. And we can produce in what used to be 57 factories in 19. Um, for us, as tragic as kind of the job change was, the company's a lot more fit and it's going to be here for its second 100 years. It's just celebrating its 100th birthday this year. In studying this question of complexity, there's a real perverse notion that hit me, which is that systems, as they try to move from the state they're in to the state they should be, tend to not want to give up the virtues that made them so great. Now, that may seem like country logic, but in a science-based way, it's actually pretty certain. Because it explains why I call it perverse, is why do systems choose to die rather than thrive? There's no death wish, certainly of businesses or big systems. It's because you have to kind of trick your mind to leave the virtues that made you so great. So the rest of my talk today is to try and just depict for you the way to, that I built context of that for Steelcase and have a little fun doing it. Larry Keeley, who's a lifelong friend, kind of a mentor of mine, uh, is at the Institute of Design. I know he spoke last night. And Larry and Pat Whitney and Bob Galvin, who ran Motorola, 
were kibitzing once on this question of context building that I'm uh, going to use today. And I changed the chart a little bit, changing the vertical axis to think about this state shift from fit to unfit. And the insight is that over time, the ability for us to make things gets much better. So consider an airplane, uh, some sort of scanning machine that you might see out here, or a chair like this versus the desk that John had to make in the summer work that he did. Over time, technology, refinement, they actually are easier to make. They're actually better. At the same time, this is a hypothesis, is that there's a degradation of the inside of human, humanness. There's a pattern shift of the way humans behave and we lose it. And because we lose it, there now becomes a gap between what the product or the experience or the service is supposed to do and what humans really want. So I'm off to pick on the airplane industry because the planes that we fly on in this new 787 um, are some of the best aeronautical equipment ever built. In fact, the 787 is purposeful about trying to change the experience for us. As, as the, that plane gets into uh, use, you'll see what I'm talking about. But why is it so hard to keep track of the context of that? Why does that line bend downward? When well, the science part, fitness regresses to the mean. It, it tends to average itself. It doesn't, if it doesn't change, that's what happens. Things around you get better. In our world, the world of work, the icons on the left are kind of the, what you might remember about work, a skyscraper. Uh, nine to five, you're kind of in this room, there's a lot of trained professionals as individuals, and you have to understand the governing structure, the hierarchy you work. On the right, that context is all jumbled up. The mobile systems you're carrying on your belt have empowered you, such that if the Apple iPhone costs $299 in five years, it'll cost one-tenth and be ten times more powerful. Again, in five years, one-tenth, ten times more powerful. We'll see peasants in India be able to run computing systems from their hands as powerful as the system that runs my company today. That's a form of fitness that emerges. 24-7 and working as teams and the nature of networks is another talk if I had more time in terms of what's happened to work. But that's what we had to deal with. So, I decided to have a little fun with you today and show you, I'm not going to run clips for sake of time, but just the stills, to have you see three movies that if you thought about them in a context of what you see, and ask yourself, how did they actually evolve from what we saw in that movie? I watched All the President's Men a weekend ago, and I had forgotten about the movie. There's a scene where Robert Redford finds out Deep Throat says, follow the money. So he goes into the library at the Washington Post, and if the clip were running here, you would see a number of phone books from all over the country. And to the Minnesotans, he's actually in that phone book and finds the name on the check from someone in Minnesota. So from a context standpoint, when that movie was made and you're watching it, that system seems highly reliable and highly modern but how does it feel now? Watching the movie, I thought, well, my goodness, they got all these books. He could just Google that name. <laughs> but the riddle is, what happened to the Washington Post? And that's why a transform conference is so difficult, is that when you're thinking about the context of change, you can't let yourself just stop at kind of the interesting obvious. There's actually layers that go beyond that. So we now know the paper design itself is under attack because of the same system that could Google the phone number. Or one of my favorites, I watch every Thanksgiving, is planes, trains, and automobiles. And Steve Martin is flying from New York to Chicago. There's a weather problem, and they route him to Wichita. And he's laboring to get to the front of the line to call for a room. And remember Dale, his friend with the shower curtain rings, has already beaten him to the punch. 
So the riddle on this one is you go, well, we would master that today because we have a cell phone. We wouldn't stand in line. Or even if you were thinking more deeply, you'd go, I'm on a plane that has wireless. I just call ahead while we're circling O'Hare. And when I hear we're in Wichita. But again, you'd miss the riddle. Because why does Steve have to go to New York to have the meeting to begin with? He's presenting an ad campaign that he could do over telepresence with high def quality, and he wouldn't have missed his family's Thanksgiving. Or another famous movie that as you watch Wall Street and you see all the computers around in the 1980s version, you now think, well, maybe, Jim, this place has a picture of the future. There's data all around Charlie Sheen. And if we ran the movie to the more current version of this, you'd see that the data was just more prolific in the next version. There were more screens. And there's algorithms that are depicting for him, and just not a, uh, a ticker strip, a strip. But the riddle in this is, do we even need Charlie? That is actually a double joke, but <laughs> because my friend that runs the New York Stock Exchange, Duncan Niederauer, is about to merge the German enterprise into the French, into the US, and have 24-7 electronic trading. Jim Hackett's not an advocate for getting rid of humans, because you'd miss the point. It's really about what is it about the nature of these human patterns that made these experiences decline in relevance? They look silly today. Yet, as John talked about that trial in the plant and the kind of things I had to do at Steelcase, people would swear that there's no reason to change when it's about them. And this is a very human insight if we had more time that we could talk about. So what we've tried to do is turn the company to exploit this gap in just a few minutes more, and I explain how we've done that. The first thing we did is we said to ourselves that there's kind of an underlying framework <clears throat> for that gap. The social thing is really the humanness thing. It's just a little more revved up than observing that people are carrying cell phones. As I told one of my executives here today, Sarah Armbruster, I tried to call you at lunch, but her phone was in her purse. The so women have a big disadvantage because they don't want to be rude and have the phone ring. It's in their purse. That's an example of the technology is getting better in smartphones, but the recognition of how she needs to use it has declined. What we're doing is taking the humanness of those kinds of issues and now thinking about how they socially kind of depict uh, a future. We also translate that into space. That's our business. So obsessive as I am, I come in here and see all the great things that we've created in the conference and everything I'd want to change about it, you know, based on what we've learned. And then information is an intolerable thing at times, but we can't live without it. So we have to design for it and design for it in a human way. So those are all products in those pictures that I already used my shameless moment up that are coming from Steelcase. One of the insights then that you do in this kind of work if you took the chart that I talked about and you saw kind of this brusque challenge between how complex systems are, all the variables are interacting, and something emerges that's going to be the winner, if you buy into the fact that an underlying rule is if you kind of get the human part right first, you've got a chance to be more fit. In fact, I'd submit to you that the obsession with efficiency can only come once you get the human part right. Because rarely does someone come through the Mayo Clinic, have their life saved, and, and say, I wish I didn't have to pay as much. They might argue about insurance and this or that, but I think the nature of the experiences that I have been able to achieve here, or in the case of selling Steelcase, is if we solve really tough human problems, we get embraced. So this chart says that as you discover that, as you discover the complex nature of things, and you're focused on humans, underlying rules appear. And that part of the talk is too long as well. 
But in my case, this is what spirited me for more than a decade. And I actually apply this talking to Dr. LaRusso, Dr. LaRusso one night a year ago. As you think about humans being as individuals and as teams, that's the I and we axis, and then fixed and mobile. That's the technology, but it's also other things. It could be in hospitals, the notion of centered healthcare versus distributed healthcare. In our case, we were able to say the cubicle, which had made the company very famous, isn't the only place that people prefer to work when they need to be by themselves. The phone has made them in the upper right, right quadrant more mobile. But they tend to collaborate. So you're actually in a Wii space today with mobile technology. You're in the lower right quadrant. We've invented a new idea there called day lodging, or WorkSpring as the brand name is known. And it's being tested in Chicago right now. So you basically, as you meander nomadically that you might be, you can go to a place which is designed for the way you actually need to work. It's not just rentable desk space. And then the lower left is uh, something that I personally, all of these were important, but this became a really fun challenge as to how to change the meeting experience. I mean, you can imagine the tape we have of people wrestling with trying to plug the projector in for a meeting. And so we called that the fixed we idea. And one of my colleagues, Terry West, who heads the strategic design for our R&D is part of the innovation group here at Mayo and will be here for the next few days. He actually led the study of this. And uh, quickly what it allows you to do is you bring any input device you have to the meeting and uh, uh, an IDO design puck system allows you to display that information instantly like a game show. And if somebody has a better thing on their iPhone or their iPad or their PC, they override you. And so in a way, the web, the infinite nature of the web is now part of the implicit discussions. An idea will be when we stare back at doctors talking to patients, well, we see it as silly that we drew with our hands the shape of their knee and how the architecture might work versus being able to have a very intimate discussion where they can see the design of that, they can do a fly through like Nucleus Media does, they can actually earmark parts of the video and send that back with that patient who might be scared to death and not listening. That's an example of the ability to make things and understand human patterns. So I'll end my talk with this last slide and invite you to come and see us in Grand Rapids. We actually uh, build spaces to try and provoke this. So we've built future of hospitals and future of healthcare, working on some really exciting things. The biggest project in the company right now is this work cafe that just opened two weeks ago. We had to squeeze 500 people into our corporate headquarters and we thought, not everybody needs a workstation. But the cafeteria had only 20% of utilization that during lunchtime, and it was empty the rest of the time. So we took that notion and built a globally integrated enterprise. You can go down there and be connected to anyone in the world. You can work at odd hours. You can meet people. You have lots of these kind of special meeting places that I've talked about. Let me stop there and tell you how much, again, it's an honor to be here and how important the Mayo is to me personally. Thank you. <laughs>